right? So we're here. So here's a type of clicker question I'll give you where you'll note there's two points of correct answer and two points of incorrect answer. Okay. So this is one type of thing where I want you to think about the answer. And there are some answers that are correct, but you're not, not going to be penalized for not knowing the right answer. Okay. If you're not penalized for not showing up for class. Yes. You can tell you're really honest students because, you know, if you weren't, you'd be like, okay, yeah, whatever's the first button I press. You're all like thinking carefully through this. It's very good. Except for one person who answered right away. <laughs> okay. Commit. So we only have one answer. Can I ask a question about this question? Yep. Is there ever a case in nature where hybridization doesn't lead to uncorrect answers? Maybe. Yeah, it's like, it's like it, I have a question. I have a question about the question. Is the answer A? <laughs> Okay, yeah. this is a legit question. Um, spring the intermediates. Oh, so the hybrid offspring. <coughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Who are presumably intermediate in some quantity of traits. What? No, it's still just one. Okay. Okay. Um, that gives us double points for the last one. Fix it. Okay. So let's have a finger vote. One, two, three, or four, corresponding to A, B, C, D. Ooh. Okay. Some of the ones. Explain why one. Because I ruled out all the other ones. Okay. So some controversies. Let's go through the lecture and figure out what the answer is. <coughs> so we don't think of hybridization being bad, right? So we had this example last time of these hybrid frogs where the tadpoles don't develop well or die or continue to become tadpoles until you know they can be huge, giant, and fertile tadpoles. Right? So we often think hybridization is bad for that reason. <coughs> but in biology, there's often exceptions. It's always safer to say sometimes in biology. Because you know, lots of species, lots of individuals, there's always going to be some freak out there. Right? So here's a case of sunflowers. Right? And they're various sunflower species, and there are these ones that we know are from hybrid origin. Okay? And you can look at that by looking at their DNA and saying, OK, look, they have some genes from this parent, some genes from this parent. Okay? Oftentimes, they'll have um, polypolarization, polypolarization, which just means Allo, different, poly, many, ploidy, the number of gene copies. And so they'll actually have a, a full copy of one parental genome and a full copy of another parental genome. Okay. So this happens in many hybrid species and plants. Okay. And <coughs> one of the thing about these um, is the hybrids occur in sort of weird habitats. Okay. Um, the, the parental species can't survive in. Okay. And why is this? Well, it's thought that this has been called transgressive segregation. Okay, it's transgressive, but it's okay. Um, and the idea is you have quantitative traits. So certain genes that say become a little bigger, become a little smaller, right? So if you get married and your spouse is much shorter than you, expect your kids to be intermediate height, right? <coughs> expect their various genes that some may make you taller, some make you smaller. And so the idea here is that in the parental species, 
This has some genes that make plus, some genes that make minus. This has other genes that make minus, other genes that make plus. Okay? But when they combine, you might by chance end up getting all the plus alleles, or all the minus alleles, or a mixture. Okay? And so your genetic variation increases. And so now we have look at tall, look at short, and intermediate ones. Right? And it's possible the ones that are on one edge, you know, might not compete well in the parental habitat, might be really good at you know, pulling up water from their roots, or they're good at withstanding heat. Okay? And so they, by having more variation, you have more natural selection. It's possible they can invade habitats that the parents can't get into. And suspect that's what happens in these um, plants. Okay? So that's why the correct answer was, was D sometimes. All right, so we do see, see cases like frogs, those, those frogs. We also see counterexamples like these sunflowers. Okay. Yeah? Did you say that hybridization in animals isn't as possible as, as it is in plants? see. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it seems to, seems to be more frequent in animals, but uh, more frequent in plants, but it can happen in animals too. So here's an example. Um, So here we have a case of some fruit flies. So the hybrid can do things the parents can do. So it can happen in animals too. So good, you're thinking well. We see the final. <laughs> okay. Um, and here we have some empirical evidence of hybridization. All right. So what is, what is this showing? So here we have the two parent taxa are this one and this one. Okay. And we see these hybrids that have a mixture of genetic information from both parents. Okay, so this is how you get evidence for hybridization. Okay. And here we see <coughs> um, sorry, how different uh, Variance in seed output in different sites. And so in parental site one, the parent, the parent does well. In parental site two, the parent does well. But hybrids do well on the other side. Okay? And now we can talk about sort of gene flow across gradients. Okay? So what is this plot showing us? So what does what does a black circle mean? Nope. Most of the species. Right. Yep. And then white is Carolina. Right? And then as we go through, we have sort of intermediate months of hybridization. Yeah. And so you can see here that how they sample all the way up. <coughs> and so what you see here, you see that there's this gradation, right? It's not that you have if they were two good species with no gene flow, what would you see? Just a line of demarcation between the two groups. Mm -hmm. Right, I'd see you know, all black here, and all white here, and no intermediates. Right, if they weren't exchanging genes. Okay. So I see that it actually looks like they are exchanging genes. Okay. And here we can see <coughs> the same data presented in a different way. Looking at, I have different genotypes as they go across. And I have this band here where it seems to rapidly switch from one set of genotypes to the other. Okay, this is the hybrid zone. All right. Um, <coughs> it's been a while of work on looking at how these clients evolve. And, you know, we sometimes see cases of a sort of stable boundary between different species that last for apparently thousands of years. Right, so we have parental species one, parental species two, with gene flow between them. In respect, you either have them all mixed, become one species, or gene flow drop off and become two good species. 
that we're starting to see is that sort of they are stable in both location and frequency through time. Okay. So here's an experiment looking at um, so sort of sympatric speciation, uh, basically sympatric speciation. Okay. Um, sort of a torture device for flies. And so you put a fly in and have it wander around to where it's happiest. Okay. And these differ on various axes. So these are covered with tape, very sophisticated study, uh, to make it dark. These are light. Okay? These are down, these are up. And there's different smells in the middle one too. And so you can try evolving and say, okay, if I only pick flies from this file and this file, right, and then mix them together, have them breathe, and keep going off, I'm inducing strong um, diversifying selection. Does that make sense? Why? Because it transfers to the very different mm -hmm. And I only choose the two most extreme. I don't choose any intermediates, right? So it's like you have to like the you know dark down and um, ethanol, or you have to like light up and see a lot of hide, right? And if you like, you know, dark but up, you're dead. Effectively, you have no offspring, right? <coughs> so this describes it. Do you just read through that? Scroll up. All right, and here are the plots. Okay, and what does this tell you? Translocation <coughs> sort of speciated to form two different streams, mm -hmm. or they can function as intermediates. Right, and here is the so. This row is control ones, where they didn't select based right. on where they are. And so they don't, they don't, because it's possible you could get divergence in eye color anyway, right, just by chance. <coughs> see how that goes. But then the treatment we see, oh, yeah, they do. Yeah, you do both, you know, when, you know, both placement and time, or just placement. Um, you see this difference. You see this little lack of gene flow evolve. Okay, interesting. Another question that deals with speciation is incompatibility, soft compatibility. Okay. So, you know, we, if I want to have a kid by myself, I can't, right? I, I produce only sperm, no eggs, I'm out of luck. Right? Some things can, some things are hermaphrodites. Um, and one common group of hermaphrodites are often many plants. Okay? But some plants don't self. Okay? It means that they have to breed with another plant in order to have offspring. Okay. This seems weird. Why does it seem weird? Why would you ever want to self pollinate? How is that helping? Well, that's a good question. 
Why do you, you want to self pollinate? I guess if you your offspring. Yeah. Yeah. So there's two reasons. Yeah. So one is sort of LE effects, right? If you're the only, if you're the only plant around, you know, I don't think outcross. You know, you have no seeds. That's a strong selection. And the other thing is the parentage, right? So I can have two sets of kids: ones that are 100% me, or ones that are 50% me, right? Because I have, you know, the pollen come in and I just produce the eggs. I'm only half related to those, so it makes it make genetic sense to have, you know, more my offspring more related to me. So then, why do we see lack of selfing sometimes? And plants have. I mean, here's this very, you know. Um, sort of elaborate system that can recognize, oh, you know, your pollen, your pollen tube growing down from me, I'm not going to let you fertilize the eggs. Okay, so the plants can detect actually that, oh, you're part of me. Tough luck, no pollination for you. Right, and so there are various systems for this that have evolved multiple times. But there's nothing, so though, anytime you see a complex system, it must have evolved in natural selection, right, or sexual selection. So, what, what could be the evolutionary advantage of this? If you self-pollinate, then you're going to be more likely to get um, other girls to get their egg recessive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have recessive alleles, right? So an average, like each of you, has like five alleles that, if you know, homozygous would cause a fa fatal. It like, would be fatal in your offspring. Right. Um, one of the argument against it, though, is that if you self a lot, those sort of get purged through natural selection. But you're right, that could be one thing. It's another thing. <coughs> if you live in an unstable environment, it would be good to have, it would be more advantageous to have more diverse gene pools, even if you're only one person. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it would be more adaptable. And we'll see this when you come back when you talk about why have sex. Right? Same thing where if you have more variation, you can respond to natural selection better, or respond to you know things trying to you know things being selected to eat you better. Right? You can have evolved diseases and that sort of thing. So to understand this, we'll create a model that had self incompatibility and a rate of loss of self incompatibility to become self compatible. Okay? And then also things could go extinct or speciate. And here we see a simulation I wrote to show what happens. Right, so things start off self-incompatible <coughs> and periodically go extinct. Right? And then sometimes become self-compatible. So what's happening with simulation? I'm sorry, this will be on me. Can you explain it one more time? Sure. So I start off, so I have, it can be self-incompatible or self-compatible, okay? okay. Uh, purple, green. And then at some point I can, you know, have a have mutation and lose self-incompatibility. So that's a whole complex system of saying, oh, are you, are you for me? I'll delete that pollen. Can be lost, right? It's a complex trait, can be lost. But also I can have extinction and speciation in each of those states. Okay. And the idea is that if um, you're more evolutionarily flexible, being self incompatible, uh, uh, being self incompatible, then you should have a higher speciation rate or lower extinction rate. Okay. And so what we see here is that you know yes, there is a higher um, diversification rate here, but because of this transition, you end up going extinct. Or you end up going all self compatible. Okay. And so, um, does that make sense? Yeah. So, there's this long term fight in evolution about sort of species selection versus individual, individual selection. Okay? And so, you can say, um, are things doing things for the good of the species or for individual goodness or individual fitness? Right? Um, <coughs> You know, if I, deliver, if I discover people are made of meat and start eating them, right? That's not good for the species. It's fewer people, right? But it's good for me. 
right? And so people can kind of catch up with me, right? But I have more resources. And so there's this conflict between individual selection and sort of species selection. And so here we see an example of that where individual selection, you know, if you become self-compatible, you can potentially have more offspring, they're more related to you, you know, they deal with being, you know, having other, um, having need to have other plants of your species around, right? But you might go extinct at a faster rate. Okay. So in this case, with their parameter values, they end up going towards self-compatible, but having a higher extinction rate. Is there a difference between? No, just different, different replicates. And here we see the overall uh, diversification rate, right? And so even though you go this way, self-compatibility expects you to be preserved because you have a higher diversification rate. So you keep switching here because of individual selection, you need to have more species and keep popping up new species. Okay. You see, you see this, you know, nothing appears where zero is, because self compatible has a net negative diversification rate. So it goes extinct more often than it speciates. Okay. Other question? So which ones are the two models? The self compatible one. Let's get the question. And so the idea is that individual selection keeps pulling you here, right? It keeps going extinct more often. So it just maintains those that remain SI keep replenishing. Okay. <coughs> okay. Here's an observation in Haldane's rule. Okay. So you can figure, figure out a pattern on that. You can talk to your neighbors about this. So what's the pattern of just Drosophila? Okay, well, well, so what's the experiment they're talking, think, they're thinking about here? Idea. All right, so it's I have two different species. I mate them with each other, and then I say, okay, do you have any offspring? Um, are they both fertile? Are they fertile? And these are only those cases where I might not have, I only have, say, female, male offspring, or I might only have female offspring. Or if I do have offspring of both sexes, only one is fertile, the other is sterile. Right, so there's weird sex difference, right? Whereas in, in Syndrosophila, the males are invariable much more often than females in these pairs, and males are sterile much, much more often than females. Right? Same thing in mammals, opposite in birds, opposite in lefts. So butterflies and moths. Okay. Any way this could be? So what's between a, a male and female in Drosophila? Or in mammals, do mammals? <coughs> mm -hmm. So in Drosophila, in, in mammals, males have XY, females have XX. Good. Let's do this stuff. What happens in birds? Males are XX. Yeah. We use Z and W instead, but right. So effectively, um, although I'll use these terms, just which would be easier to understand. Males are effectively XX and females are effectively XY. Okay. 
draw an X. Okay. So now what do you think? <coughs> what were the relative ratios of sizes for X and Y chromosomes? Yeah, X is much easier. Why is this little tiny strip of a thing? Right? This is like, you know, make male hormone. And it's basically done. Okay? So where the X has lots of genes you use for many, many functions. So now what do you think? The Y chromosome is box or Nope. It's a good idea, but no. That does happen actually in mammals that we've had like re-evolution of Y several times, but that's not what explains this. Well, if that were the case, so in that case, if two X's were deleterious, then I would expect to see more females having trouble in Drosophila, right? Mm -hmm. Is you have some redundancy, right? So let's say, you know, I have some certain essential gene, you know, here on this chromosome, and then in, you know, it's lost in the other species and moves somewhere else in the genome, right? Well, here, if in females, in Drosophila minerals, I'd have at least one copy of that gene, right? But in males, I could miss that copy, right? I could only have one of the X's, and so I don't have this redundancy. And so it leads to higher rates of inviability and sterility. Okay. It's a very neat example of you know, this weird pattern across, I mean, these are hundred, you know, a few hundred species, right? all these independent comparisons. And yet this, you know, this overall pattern can be largely explained by just how their sex chromosomes are. So is there like a condensed Hubbard's rule as well? Yeah, so the um, heterogametic sex only has one of the large X chromosomes, and so it could have lost some of the, so there's no redundancy there, so it has to have all the genes that are needed on that one X chromosome for both species. But if those genes are then lost in one of the species, it doesn't have, it won't, won't be viable, it won't be fertile. Sense? It's kind of dealing with two identical And you might need and you might need a gene from each. Yeah. Okay. The next case is cytoplasmic incompatibility. Okay. And this comes up in, in speciation as a possible speciation mechanism. So we talked about DMIs, we talked about sort of things involving an allopatry. But here is a very, very cool mechanism that we're looking at now. So what is this what, what's what's this plot about? <laughs> Right, exactly. And here's sort of classic Wolbachia behavior, where if the male, so Wolbachia is transmitted only maternally, just like just like our mitochondria, okay. Um, so it's passed mother to mother to ch children, okay. And so if a male Wolbachia mates with a female without Wolbachia, they have no offspring. Okay. If a male with Wolbachia, and the if a male without Wolbachia mates with a male, female with Wolbachia, she has offspring. Will those offspring have or not have Wolbachia? They'll have it, right, good. If, she, if this one could have offspring, but do they have it or not? No. No, right. This one? The offspring may have Wolbachia. This one? Offspring no Wolbachia, right? So, in the way that everything sort of behaves normally, except this case, right? Why would Wolbachia be selected for causing this to happen? Or why, you know, 
It is, is based on selection. So, yeah, so this Wolbachia is very unlucky, right? It's going to be this male, it's not going to be passed on, it's going to die, right? So, oh well, it can't help it, can't do anything, right? But it can actually help its siblings, right? So it shares genes with some of the Wolbachia in this female, right? Presumably. And if it can, you know, make it so that females that have Wolbachia produce more offspring than females that don't, then the genes that allow that will increase the frequency in the population. Right? It's like um, if I have a bunch of siblings, you know, I can preserve my, I can, you know, genes that make me reproduce can be passed on. Genes that make me help my siblings, since my siblings have 50% 50, 50 relationship with me, and if I can help them reproduce more too, then those genes also get passed on, most likely. Okay, so it's known as group selection. Okay. But I was just thinking that that trait didn't really get passed on to humans, at least not in our society. Well, I mean, we help our siblings somewhat. Right? We have maternal, we have, we have family groups, right? We have grandmas that help protect kids and that sort of thing. Right? So there is some evidence. It's not just, you know, you, you know, you're more likely to help your sibling than you are to help a random stranger. And that's about kidney donation. That sort of thing. Yeah. But yeah, but it doesn't work perfectly, of course. And it also means like you would still compete with your sibling for food and that sort of thing. So you have hundreds of derivatives you really with yourself. In fact, right, here is an interesting group selection where Wolbachia <coughs> inclusive selection. Wolbachia, by making this cross sterile, can increase the frequency of Wolbachia in the population. Okay. Now, how this relates to speciation is that you're going to have, you can have DMIs go through. We can have the same sort of thing with different strains of Wolbachia. Okay. So Wolbachia wants to, you know, evolve to help itself, right? But what it recognizes itself can differ. And so here I can have, you know, Wolbachia strain B and Wolbachia strain A, okay? And eventually this can become completely, you know, this, yeah, this population can become completely full of Wolbachia A and Wolbachia B. When they mate, they go back to here and say, okay, well, I'm Wolbachia plus B, and you have no plus B here. Plus A, so no offspring for you. In the reverse, when Obaki A meets the parent of Obaki B, okay, and so it can lead to this incompatibility due to Obaki versus versus traditional like DMI genes. Make sense? If not, let me know. You're still seem a bit quizzical. Mm -hmm. Incidence in the population by yep. having that one set be sterile. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't understand that this was incompatible. Okay. Is it like a further incompatibility beyond that? So, um, this behavior, first of all, once Wolbachia gets frequent enough, this Wolbachia is sweep through the population, right? So everyone, everyone gets Wolbachia. Okay. But now we're down to basically something like this, where instead of these, I now have. Everything has Wolbachia A or Wolbachia B in different populations. So I can have a male with A and a female with A and a male with B and a female with B. Right? Actually, let me set up as a contingency table. Okay. Which of these result in offspring? Does this result in offspring? Does this? No. Does this? No. Does this? Yes. And so what this does is these two populations, A and B, every time the individuals try to mate, they end up not having offspring. Right? Because of Wolbachia. So even though genetically they could be identical, because of this infection that swept through, they can no longer have offspring. Very interesting way of, of creating, you know, two different species 
just from having the infected differently because they encode genetic change. Okay. It works in the same way as DMIs. Same as loop mechanism. Okay, so that's fair. Does that help? Yes or don't care? Either two. <coughs> now, Avaki does more than just that. Okay, so it's actually a pretty cool organism. So it creates this sort of thing, which we talked about, so like cytoplasmic incompatibility. And why does it have this name? Because the cytoplasm is incompatible. Good. <laughs> and what do they mean by cytoplasm? Like, why is cytoplasm? Why not sperm incompatibility or something? Right. right. And so before you actually can figure out it's Wolbachia, there will something in the maternal cytoplasm is present, preventing this, which happens to be the Wolbachia. Good. But they also do other things like male killing. Right? Um, <coughs> so, you know, if, if you're Wolbachia, you know, and you're, you, know, you have all your, all your, you know, you infect with the female and then she has multiple offspring, male and female, but if you can kill off all the males, but you're gonna die anyway, which are not, not gonna pass you one anyway. How the female probes throw all her resources to females, that increases your overall fitness. Right? So they can kill off males sometimes. They can send me and say, okay, I don't care if you're supposed to be a male, I'll turn you into female anyway, it's gonna be transmitted. That's this feminization thing. Okay, so partially feminized or you know, um, that. And also parthenogenesis. Okay. Parthenogenesis, virgin birth. In which case they can make them asexual, and just able to reproduce with just only females, which again helps Wolbachia because males are a dead end for them. Okay. And one thing to think about is your mitochondria have the same fitness incentives as Wolbachia do. Right? So uh, my mitochondria are pretty annoyed that they're in a male, because right? there's almost no chance of getting out of me. Right? And so they could have some way of having you know, my sister got all my, my, my mother's resources rather than me, that would, that would be advantageous for them, right? But the issue with mitochondria is it's been so co co for so long, it has actually few genes. It has, so, you know, less ability to take care of that. A lot of things are pushed into the nucleus, so they have that sort of lost control, okay? So it's just thing, interesting to think about, like, you know, conflict between different parts of your body in terms of genetically. Is that? Any questions about any of this? This is a lot of material. So the Wolbachia alters their behavior? Um, I'm not sure exactly how, how I mean, they all, I mean, since males and females have different behavior, like, yes, in this case, they alter behavior. Um, I'm not sure what, how it's altered here. Yeah. Um, but there are actually parasites that do alter behavior. This is one parasite in mice that makes them seek out cats, like really like cat urine, and go run over to where the cats are. And it's because the next step in the sort of life cycle of the parasite, has to be, the mouse has to be eaten by a cat to go into the next, to the next host. And so if you can make the mice really like cats, you get transmitted better. Okay. And actually humans have the same parasite, and actually it's been shown to affect human behavior too. So it's not, not as radical as like seeking out cats, yeah, but affecting like sort of risk-taking behavior and that sort of thing, which is kind of scary. Evolution is really cool. I've been thinking about like when you have things competing with each other and sort of different different fitness optima between like Wolbachia and host or parasites and host, seeing how that plays out can be really interesting and illuminating about how evolution works. Other questions? All right. Thank you all. <laughs>